Here we go. Welcome to the One Hope of Original Christianity, Chapter 3, Session 10, The Tribulation and Wrath, Part 3. We're still covering the Tribulation and Wrath periods in the book of Revelation because the sections of the book between the master phrase repetitions are not chronological, being structured on a different basis. They cover from the gathering together through the resurrection of the just. Therefore, events in each section overlap. In the last session, I spoke of the nexus of the story of redemption, Leo and Virgo. This is part of the Zodiac, and it's the Maseroth spoken of in Job. Please turn to Job, Job chapter 38, Job 38, verse 31. And here it says, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? These are constellations. The word influences is delights, as in springtime. And the bands of Orion is signaling the winter because they come up during that season. Verse 32, Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? The Maseroth is the zodiac. Verse 33, Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? See, back then, their calendar was in the sky. In modern times, we've forgotten the significance of the light of the nighttime sky. Because when night falls, we turn our electric lights on and continue our affairs until we tire and go to bed. But before the 20th century, most of the world stopped when night fell and went to bed, and the stars dominated the night. To them, it would be unthinkable that today I would have to explain the following things to you. They were familiar with them because they saw them every night. Imagine that you are in a room right now, which is the universe. And the constellations are painted on the walls and ceiling. Now, if you're driving in your car and listening to this, please don't imagine that, okay? Concentrate on driving, all right? <laughs> but if you're not driving, imagine the sun is in the middle of the room. And if you want, you can go ahead and move a chair there into the middle of the room that you are in. And then the back of that chair sticking up would represent the sun. So what we're going to do is we're going to simulate a sunrise by turning your head away from the sun in the middle of the room and then slowly turn back your head until the sun or the chair representing it is in the corner of your eye. You just simulated a sunrise or a sunset. Now, what's on the wall of the room directly behind the sun? That, on that wall, would be one of the 12 constellations of the zodiac. So, now as the months pass, the earth goes around the sun. So, I want you to change chairs in the room. Or if you're sitting on the couch, scoot to the other end of the couch. Now, Look at the sun again, or the chair that represents the sun. And something on the wall behind it now is different. That represents a different constellation of the zodiac. Every month as, as the earth goes around the sun, a different constellation of the zodiac is behind the sun. Now, if you went all the way around the room, and strung all the constellations together as you looked at the sun, the line that they would make on the opposite wall around the room is called the ecliptic. So, now in your mind's eye, 
I want you to tilt that circle of the ecliptic all around the room that would have been behind the sun as you went around tilt that up on one side so it's about a quarter of the way up in your mind's eye and therefore then the other side would be a quarter of the way down well that's how the ecliptic appears at night to us in the United States with the side that's up arcing across the, th the southern sky and the other side is below the horizon consequently every sunrise and every sunset of every month there will be a constellation that will disappear or appear on the east or west horizons as night turns to day and back again that's how you can imagine how these constellations work everyone before our great grandfathers were probably very familiar with each of the 12 constellations and they could tell what month it was by what constellation was in the background at sunrise or sunset the 12 constellations were called the Maseroth in Hebrew this also is the circuit that is spoken of in Psalm 19. Now, the Pleiades and Orion mentioned in there in Job are not among the 12 constellations of the zodiac. They are higher in the sky than the ecliptic, but they were well known because of their bright stars. And the Pleiades would be high in the sky in the springtime, and Orion would be high in the sky in the winter. Now, of course, in the southern hemisphere, that would be opposite. So, turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 1. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament thereof shows his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. A tabernacle is a tent, a temporary dwelling place. And so every month the sun is in a different constellation. Verse 5, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing as a strong man to run a race. In other words, this is not under a bushel. It's right out there so everybody can see it. Brash and bold. Verse 6, his going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And of course, when believers saw the Zodiac, they thought of the story of redemption that had been told to them by the prophets. That is why it said night unto night shows knowledge, because the constellations told the story of redemption. That original story was told by the ancient prophets Noah and Shem and Abraham and others. And they used the stars as a monomic, as an aid to memory, to tell the story of redemption. Unbelievers changed the significance of the constellations, and that original knowledge was lost, except for parts of it, which have been retained in the ancient star names. More information can be found on this subject in E.W. Bullinger's book, Witness of the Stars. At this point in the exposition of the book Revelation, we have arrived at one of the more difficult sections of the book, which is the interlude between the sounding of the trumpets. Ranko Stefanovic pointed out in that paper that we have on Way Beyond that the first and second sections with the seven seals and the seven trumpets respectively had an interlude between the sixth and seventh items. Both sequences have this interlude. And also one can notice that the seven trumpets and the seven bowl plagues 
are deliberately parallel terms of their language and their content because the first one affects the earth in both cases, the second one the sea, the third one in both cases the rivers and fountains, the fourth one in both cases the sun, uh, the fifth one involves darkness, the sixth one in both cases involves the river Euphrates. So that's interesting, isn't it? These parallel sequences portrayed the ancients' concept of the entire cosmos, the dry land and the sea and the bodies of fresh water, the lights in the heavens and the darkness. Then in the Middle East, the Euphrates River was a ribbon of life through the parched land, just like the Nile in Egypt. It dominated their lives with its ebbs and flows. This was all they knew of the world. They had no concept of China or Australia or the Arctic or the jungles of Africa or the Americas. The Mediterranean Basin and Mesopotamia were the entire world to them. Remember, John the Apostle was not writing to us modern folks. We must put ourselves in the mind of a first century believer to understand what he wrote. God was communicating to him in terms he knew and understood. So all the quote unquote world to them was the Middle East and around the Mediterranean. So this sequence expresses that future calamities will impact the world and all of its systems, the world they knew. This illustrates why we can't interpret the book from a modern standpoint. The fifth trumpet seems to also involve an astronomical component stating that a star will fall from heaven. But this star is definitely figurative for an angel because it says he was given a key. And so then in the fifth trumpet, we encounter a mysterious term in the Bible about which we have scant knowledge. This is the abyss. Turn to Revelation 8, 13. Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the abyss, the bottomless pit. The words translated bottomless pit in Greek are, quote, the pit of the abyss. The pit, ferrer, is a deep well, and abusos in Greek is the abyss. There are only a few references to the abyss. This is a term referring to part of the spiritual realm. We do not know much about that because it's beyond the reach of the five senses. So the only reference we can trust is the Bible. I'm sure the people have made a lot of guesses about it, but all I'm going to trust is scripture. There are a number of words in the Bible that refer to facets of the spiritual realm. The deep, the sea, waters, mountains. God uses these terms to describe the indescribable because the spiritual realm is incomprehensible. Spiritual beings move into and out of it from our physical realm, which the physicists call space-time. I believe that there are other dimensions in the universe beyond what we know, and the spiritual realm is one of them. We explored this concept a bit in the One Spirit class. God describes the facets of the spiritual realm by comparing them to things in the physical realm that we can conceive of. Psalm 104 contains a clustering of such terms. Please turn to Psalm 104. Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, 
who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. The light is so bright, we can't see the details beyond it. Consequently, it is covering things up. No man can see the face of God and live. It would be a psychic overload. <laughs> it would short circuit our brains. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and we're going to have to be changed to survive it. Then in the second half of verse 2, what do curtains do? In that era, they formed a visual barrier between rooms in a tent. Curtains separated areas in the tabernacle and temple. We look skyward and see the stars as if embroidered on a tapestry, but we cannot see the spiritual realm beyond them. It's not beyond them in distance. It's beyond them in comprehension. It's not beneath them in position. It's beneath them in foundation. It's not around them in sight. It's around them in power and influence, but it is still there. Psalm 104, verse 3. Who layeth the beams of his chambers, or lofts, in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. God builds his towers up to his upper chambers with beams grounded in the waters in the spiritual realm. As he moves through the spiritual realm, which is what chariots are used for, to transport generals and leaders, he moves within the clouds so his movements cannot be seen. God walks upon the invisible wind. This prose is beautiful, depicting waters, clouds, and wind, all terms with spiritual import. Verse 4, Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Angels move in and out of the spiritual and physical realms, energized by God, while carrying out his bidding, sometimes being in concrete form when needed and invisible spirit form at other times. He energizes them to enforce against, protect from, or drive away evil by means of spiritual fire armaments. He makes his ministers a flaming fire. Psalm 104 verse 5 who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed or slip forever. He set the foundational laws for the physical and spiritual realms forever unalterable. Psalm 104, verse 6a, first part. Thou coverest or conceals it with the deep as with a garment. The deep is so deep, one can't see the bottom. Thus, it covers the spiritual realm like a garment. Psalm 104, 6, second half of the verse. The water stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains. They go down by the valleys under the place which thou hast founded for them. The waters have a different application here than earlier. These are the waters of the evil realm that once covered the earth. God set boundaries that they should not cross, and when they do, when they do violate that border, he punishes them. Psalm 104, verse 9, Thou hast set a bound that they, the waters, may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. God contains the eroding ravages of the waters by setting up and enforcing spiritual boundaries. So these all are facets of the spiritual realm, one of which is the deep, the abyss. When believers pray for others and cast out devils, they get expelled into the abyss, the deep. They are kicked out of contact 
with the physical five senses realm. Mark eleven twenty three talks about this. Mark eleven twenty three. Jesus said, For verily I say to you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Jesus was speaking of a specific mountain here. He said, this mountain. He didn't say a mountain. Well, what was this mountain? This mountain was Jerusalem that was built on a hill. The fig tree, a symbol of Israel, had just dried up overnight. And he said this to his astounded apostles. This established the revelation that the fig tree, Israel, would reject the Messiah and his kingdom. Mountains are symbolic of the adversary's entrenched spiritual position, leering over and dominating. We can cast that into the sea by believing. The sea is the spiritual realm in dissolution, the deep, the abyss. The Gospel of Luke also refers to the spiritual truth. Luke 8, 30. Luke chapter 8, verse 30. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? This is legion. Because many devils were entered into him. Verse 31. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. When we cast out spirits, that's where they go. They go into the abyss. Another description of the same thing is given in Luke 11. Luke 11, verse 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also be divided against himself... How shall his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if I, cast by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But Jesus said, But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherewith he trusted and devised his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scatters. Verse 24. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He said, well, I'm going to check out my old house and see what's going on there. Well, dry places is another way of expressing this. They are dry and desolate. I talked about this in my paper that's on Way Beyond titled God's Awesome Power Over the Spiritual Realm because devils get something out of their victims when possessing them. But when they're cast out, they no longer are in contact with their victim. It's desolate. It's dry. And in the picture that's illustrated by the abyss, it's like falling. They are in free fall with no contact with the five senses realm anymore. It's like falling in an abyss, except they don't ever hit bottom. It's free fall. It's not in contact with our realm. The abyss is mentioned in a few more places. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit, the abyss, shall make war against them 
and shall overcome them and kill them. So whatever the beast was before, he was in free fall. He was out of contact with the five senses realm. He was came up out of the abyss. All right. Revelation 17.8 is another one. Revelation 17.8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, the abyss, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. The devil will be banished there for a thousand years. He will be in free fall and cannot affect the physical realm. That's what Revelation 20 talks about. Revelation 20 verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the abyss and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So this is the abyss in free fall, not in contact with the physical world. The abyss is not Tartarus. The Bible says that those incarcerated in Tartarus won't be let out until the judgment. They, these are the angels that sinned in Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1 verse 6 and the angels which kept not their first estate their first principality but left their own habitation that what they were supposed to be doing. He had reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So they are in Tartarus in chains until judgment. They're not going to be let out. All right. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell that's Tartarao. And when they got there, they said, uh oh. And delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Again, they are there till judgment. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19 is the last reference to them. By which also, when Jesus was in his resurrected body, went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So, later on in Revelation, the locusts that come out of the abyss are not these spirits, and they're not Nephilim that get sprung out of jail like some imagine. That stuff's fantasy. The next event in the book of Revelation, warned by the fifth trumpet, is something that comes out of the abyss, out of freefall. Revelation chapter 9, verse 2. Revelation chapter 9, verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green theme, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Wow. To understand this, we must first determine whether these locusts are literal or figurative. Well, there are a couple of strikes against them being literal. The first is 
They are not going to hurt any vegetation. Well, that's what physical locusts do. They devastate vegetation. The second strike is they're going to be selective and only torment those who do not have God's seal. That is, those who don't have the Spirit of God. So my vote is that the locusts are something figurative, something spiritual that comes out of the abyss. But that does not give us license to go wild and fantasize. God expressed these things the way he did for a reason. So it's probably not the helicopters from the Russian army coming down from the north, like some people say. What will it be? Well, I would say that they are a portion of the adversary's horde who disassociated themselves from their former haunts and now are attacking the unbelievers who are upon the earth. Well, why would the devil want to do that? Remember, this is during the time that he's amassing control and taking over kingdom by kingdom in his effort to achieve a one world government. Every culture of the world is going to resist that. Therefore, the more distracted men are, the more pliable. The adversary specializes in the tag team approach, is what I call it, in which he gets his victims disoriented by attack after attack after attack. In the word, this is called the whirlwind. Many of us have experienced this, attack after attack, like what happened to Job. When men are so assailed, it's difficult for them to accurately assess things and make wise decisions. Therefore, they're more apt to give in to the adversary's suggestions. Whatever this is, it's going to be terrible, and it's going to last five months, and it's going to drive unbelievers nuts. Revelation chapter 9, verse 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like on the horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, which means the destroyer. It will take them down the drain into destruction. It's the destroyer. Verse 11 is one more piece in chapter 9 of information supporting the fact that there's something spiritual because they had a leader which implies intelligence. So they're, they're not going to be insects. Whatever it is, when we observe it from our heavenly perches, we're going to slap our foreheads and exclaim, oh, that's what God meant. You see, I think it no shame if I cannot figure out some of these things. I think it's worse to guess and be wrong than to say, I don't know. So, Because I don't want to lead anyone astray. And I take my assignment of research and teaching very seriously. I think that one of the reasons why some feel driven to identify these symbols is the fact that they are unsure when the gathering together is relative to these events. They fear that they may have to experience these things. So they feel like they must be ready. Well, I think I've sufficiently proven when the gathering is relative to tribulation and the wrath period. It comes before it at the beginning of the sixth administration. Now let's resume Revelation chapter 9 with verse 12. Revelation chapter 9, verse 12. 12. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. 
The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, 200 million. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth, which is deep purple color, and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idol of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Again, I don't know exactly what these will be, but the signs are that it is figurative and spiritual. Horses are swift and powerful. I thought at first that these might be tanks equipped with lasers, napalm, or flamethrowers, you know, brimstone and fire to a first century person. And the smoke that kills would be chemical warfare. But I didn't know what the tails would represent unless they're the vapor trails of missiles, I don't know, that wind around and hit their target. But the other detail that their victims would not repent indicates that their, their victims were not believers, so their targets are selective. So it's very interesting. I, I'm not sure what these are. But when it does happen, then we'll know. The more people the adversary kills, the easier it'll be to take over the world. And the passage says one third will die. That's going to be billions. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Now, the declaration that time shall be no more and the mystery of God being finished takes us all the way to the end of the sixth administration. So that's more evidence that these are non-chronological, each of the sections. Each has their own theme. The events described in each section occur all along that timeline. Now, there's been speculation regarding the content of the mystery of God referred to here, 
as being the fulfillment of the prophecies of all the prophets since the beginning. But I don't think that's the case because those prophecies were spoken and hence not all mysteries. But earlier we covered the song of the 144,000 that only they could learn. And that also was associated with mystery in that verse in that section. And they were also called servants. So those clues echoed here, I think tied this up into a bundle. What is finished is all the events of the sixth administration. So now we get to an interlude, just like in the first section. Revelation chapter 10, Revelation chapter 10, verse eight. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now this is interesting because usually the interaction between men and angels is separate. We right now are in separate hierarchies. Um, but I think that it is still possible to interact with angels to get things done. But in this case, in this situation here, there was guidance to do so. So again, I think in most cases, we do our things separately unless there is guidance. And in this case, he interacted with an angel. Now, Ezekiel received similar instructions regarding eating a scroll and then speaking. That's in Ezekiel chapter two verse 9 through chapter 3, verse 4. To eat is symbolic. It's used of receiving instructions and making it part of yourself. Jeremiah declared, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. That's Jeremiah 15, 16. John received the revelation while he was banished by the Romans to the island of Patmos off the coast of Asia Minor. We do not know what happened to John after he wrote the book of Revelation, but this bit of information says that he would have been freed to carry out verse 11. He must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That's interesting. The second subject of the interlude is regarding the measuring of the temple. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be tread under that foot forty and two months. This is interesting. They measured the altar and the temple and those who worshipped. Since the spiritual temple coming down to earth is the subject of this third section of the book of Revelation, I'm going to cover verses 1 and 2 in another session. But I can say one thing now. This was an assignment given to John the Apostle to do. Interesting. See, in the vision, he carried out a job as if he were an angel. I can say this to you now that an assignment was given to John. We're going to be given assignments to carry out after we get to heaven too. Now, John will be one of the 24 elders because we know that from what Jesus said. So he's going to have several deployments. And one of them is to do this measuring. Interesting. 
The third subject in the interlude is regarding the two witnesses. This is another mysterious passage in Revelation. Who are the two witnesses? Why do they do what they do? Revelation chapter 11 verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, twelve hundred sixty, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Wowie zowie! How would you like to be able to witness like that? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Yeah, that'd be far better than Edith Ann and laugh in, and that's the truth. <laughs> Fire comes out of their mouth and kills those who dispute what they say. Wow. I, I know there were times when I was a missionary that I, that I wish. Uh, <laughs> and they're going to witness for 1260 days. I hope to be able to handle all these time spans in a future session. So right now, I'm, I'm not going to attempt to answer what that time span is. But I will attempt to answer who these two guys are. Are they mortal humans or angelic beings? Well, there's more information about them given in Revelation. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people in kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not allow them their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell on all them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up thither. And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Wow. So, okay, who, who can these be? Are they mortal men or angelic beings? Well, I mean, fire came out of their mouth and killed people. Also, we have to apply the rules. No mortal human can enter into heaven unless they're in a resurrection, right? So just which is, with what is stated here, I'm inclined to say these two witnesses are angels. But there is more information. Look at Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. Just, or, yeah, just before this, the seven archangels are mentioned. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 11. Then answered I and said unto them, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? Again I answered again and said to him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes emptied the golden oil out of themselves? He answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones 
that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Well, that's the same language that's used in 11.4, Revelation 11.4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So are these mortal men or angelic beings? Well, if they existed back in Zechariah, they have to be angels. All right? So that convinces me that the rules regarding resurrections and going to heaven are preserved. But let's consider the symbolism. They are associated with the oil that supplies the lamps. Well, what do lamps do? They shine light, the light of truth. So they're at the seat of the government of the beasts, one world kingdom, where I don't believe any mortal believer could survive for more than one second, are these two lights who prophesy, who tell the truth to the whole world who doesn't want to hear it. So the unbelievers are without excuse. See, this is one more way that the word gets disseminated in the sixth administration beside the 144,000. And in this case, it's declared to an obstinate and unbelieving generation who are so proud in their own knowledge that they reject the God who made them and the world around them. I think that's justice. This is justice. For when judgment comes, they're going to be without excuse. I don't think any mortals could be sent into that fire. So God sent two angels, two spiritual beings who existed before into the center of power on, in the future on earth, into the midst of the Antichrist capital city to rub their noses in the truth. Wow. I don't, I don't think any mortal would have survived. Don't you love God, our champion, our strength, and our life giver? Revelation chapter 11, verse 14. Now it moves on. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe comes quickly. Verse 15, the interlude is over. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that reverence thy name, small and great, and shouldst destroy them that destroy the earth. Verse 19, the end of the section, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, and an earthquake, and a great hail. So this scene closes the second section of Revelation with that phrase repetition. And the third section is about to commence. This section ends at the resurrection of the just as verse 18 states. The tribulation period has come and gone. The demarcation between has occurred, which was the abomination of desolation. The wrath of God is showered upon the unrepentant. The adversary has been consolidating his power in the midst of all that chaos. Meanwhile, 144,000 have taken the world to the sixth administration gospel to the world and have called those who will believe. And the two witnesses have left the rest without excuse. And so now the world is ripe for the final harvest, but that'll have to wait till after the break. Bless you.